I want you to open your Bibles, if you would, again to 2 Timothy chapter 2. But I want to remind you, we're going to finish off, I believe, I believe we'll get there today, finish off uh, the spiritual fruit of self-control. But I, I want you to also hear today, and, and I believe the Lord is going to, there's going to be something He wants to still minister into this. But today, as we said earlier, is the day of, of Shavuot, Pentecost. So 50 days, 50 days after Passover. Remember the original Shavuot, the, the fire of God came down on the mountain, the smoke and the word of God came, and, and there was a powerful manifestation of God through His word. It came and it established on the earth. Well, Jesus, the Word made flesh, was able to come 2,000 years after that. But then very, in a very short time after that, the acceleration took place. And the, as He went to heaven, uh, He sent, He went to heaven so that the Father Himself could send the power of the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in our hearts. And so the, on that 50th day, the same day the Word of God came, the Holy Spirit came, the same day on the calendar, uh, the Hebraic calendar, uh, the, Word of, the Spirit of God came and He filled the vessels. He filled the men and the women in that room. We don't know of any children in that room. There might have been kids around. I mean, there's men and women there. There's possibly kids, you know, attached to them somewhere. So we, are, we know there was about 120 in the upper room. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there and apostles and different ones. And the Holy Spirit came and He filled the temples. Well, the, the Spirit of God was no longer in, in a temple uh, separated by a veil. The Holy Spirit was now able to fill the temple. Well, the Bible says which temple you are. So if you, if you examine that and you understand that, that we are the temple of God, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, then we understand why God now, we, we being filled with the Holy Spirit and our spirit now in union with the Holy Spirit, there is now a, our temple being a holy place, a dwelling place. Hallelujah. A place where, where the fruit, the character and the nature of God Himself, of the Spirit now now entwined and in, uh, engaged in our spirit, flows and functions. And then from that place and from that holy vessel, power is able to flow. The Holy Ghost and fire and power in great manifestation through us as vessels. And so, so we need to, and we have been, looking at why God wants our vessels to be that fit for the Master's use. Why He wants these temples available for power to flow through. I think you would have to agree with me if we, if we really are honest with ourselves. What Jesus said the church should be and the power in which he, we should be functioning is not as evident today as it needs to be. Now we see glimpses of it. We see, we've seen glimpses of it. Just a couple of weekends ago we saw a major supernatural healing take place in, in Dan and Pastor C's son-in-law. I mean, it, you can't overlook this. It was significantly powerful. The doctors are scratching their heads. They cannot see, understand how there is no trace of sickness in his body. He was that close to dying. You know, it's the power of prayer. It's the powerful uh, release of of God's life into his body. And there is no other explanation other than that. Hallelujah. And so we've seen glimpses of this. But, but more, we should be seeing this more and more and more and more and more. More and more and more, and more on, a, on a daily basis. On a daily, now, the best scenario would be that we never even have to pray for each other. Because we're walking in such divine health and wholeness that the prayers, we, we just, we're fired up and ready to pray for those that need yeah. prayer out in the world. Hallelujah. You know, and the doctors are doing a good job as, as best as they know how. You know, the doctors bless them, bless the medical profession and all of the things that they've been doing. But, you know, every year they find out that there's some things they thought that were, were right were not, are not so right. And <laughs> they've got to change the, you know, understanding and application of this and that and everything else. And, um, but the power of God. The healing power of God, the miracle working power of God is available. And He wants to flow through you as His body, as His vessel. 
So, 2 Timothy chapter 2 told us in a great house that not only vessels of gold and silver, wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself of the latter, he will be a vessel for honor sanctified. I want you to hold on to that word sanctified. Sanctified. Separated. Useful. Sanctified and useful. Sanctified, separated and useful. We're not, we're not really going to be that useful if we're not sanctified. Did you hear me? We're not going to be very useful for God if we're not sanctified. Now, we're still loved. We're still going to heaven. We're still favoured. There's a whole bunch of things that we still are in God, but, it, but if we don't walk in the sanctification, if we don't allow the sanctification of what Jesus has done for us to actually outwork itself in our lives, then we're not going to be very useful. Praise God. This is not going to keep you out of, out of heaven if you don't walk out your sanctification. But, it, it, but it's going to mean that you're going to end your life and having not really pressed toward the mark of the high call in Christ Jesus. So there's, there's forgiveness, there's, there's grace, there's mercy, there's all these wonderful things which we have. And praise God for all of that. And, it's, and daily we walk in these, these blessed things. But it's, they are all there for a purpose. The mercy of God operational in your life is for a purpose. The grace of God operational in your life is for a person, purpose. The faith of God, the love of God, these things working in your life are for a purpose. To equip you to be Jesus on the earth. Amen. To let the Holy Ghost have a, a fullness of Him and fill all in all so that that all in all can flow through you and out through you and impact the lives of people around you. Otherwise, we're, we're a saved group of useless people. That sounds real strong, doesn't it? And, and it's not a condemnation. It's just a choice that we have. Whether or not we will cleanse ourselves and be useful. Now, cleansing ourselves, again, we, which is not because of anything we've done. We've studied this out. But everything that Jesus has done. How do we cleanse ourselves? We apply the blood of Jesus. We don't apply our own blood. There's nothing you can do. You can't shed your own blood to earn righteousness and, and sanctification. But the shed blood of Jesus is what has done that for us. So that, as 2 Corinthians 4 tells us, so that the extraordinary overflow of power will be seen as God's, not ours. Praise God. And so we've gone through the different fruit. We've looked at love, joy, peace, patience, kind, uh, uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and meekness. And, and we started a couple of weeks ago talking about self-control or temperance. And we, we identified the difference uh, between some of the, the things that sound very similar to that. But we understand that this word self-control means temperance, means continence. It, 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 it's... It's not just a control of attitudes and temper, which is what gentleness and meekness is, but it is a control over desire, over lust, over the things that try to uh, control you in that sense, uh, on the inside, in your heart. It's the word temperance. It's, the, it's like control over a muscle in your body. Um, and it is... It is completely opposite or the complete opposite to what the self-life is all about. The self-life, the self-focused life can, uh, really is only attentive to your needs, your wants, your desires, your goals being achieved. Now, there's nothing wrong with, with, with goals, but for the Christian, the goals are supposed to come from God. He gives you the goal. He gives you the mark. He gives you the finishing line. He is the author of your faith. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. So he's written how it's supposed to look. So if we're chasing our own goals and our own life and our own desires and our own things and our own wants, then we find ourselves all about us. But if we chase after God, we're going to find, oh, so much more. So much more fulfillment in all of that. We're not driven to run our own race. We said this a couple of weeks ago. We are motivated to run the race that is 
set before us. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we fight the good fight. Yes, we do. We run the race. Yes, we do. But it's his fight and it's his race. Hey, the good part about that is we're guaranteed to win. He's already fought the fight. He's already run the race. He's already done this. So we're just, we're just kind of getting in on his victory. Hallelujah. He's handed it all over, all over to us. Praise God. So uh, I want you to turn with me now to, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we began there last week. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Hallelujah. And uh, from verse 9, it gives us some perspective about the problem with desire uh, in a person's life, trying to gain even things that God wants you to have. You're, you're not supposed to be desiring after things. There are some things that God would want to give you, but if your desire is after them, it's going, they're going to ruin you. And money is one of those things which, which absolutely qualifies within this context. And so uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and first, from verse 9, it says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Can you see what? It, it, rich is not the problem. The desire to be rich is the problem. Money is not the problem. Remember, we, we've read this also. It's the love of money which is the problem, the root of all evil. So rich is not a problem. Rich can do great things. Did you know that? Rich can send missionaries on the mission field. Rich can build bu church buildings. Rich can, rich can put someone through Bible college. Rich can uh, start a business for the glory of God. Rich can do many things. And if you have a problem with the word rich, you need to go back and study Abraham. Multi-billionaire. And then you want to study Isaac. And then you want to study Jacob. And they just kind of compounded and got bigger and, and they got very, very rich and exceedingly rich. Well, there's no problem with rich then if we're supposed to have the blessing of Abraham. Is that right? Now think about this. Galatians tells us that we no longer are under the curse, but we now have the, the blessing of Abraham. So, so there's not a, God does not have a problem with rich. He has a problem with your desire. When, you're, when you are pulled from the, with the inside, with your attitudes and your emotions and your thoughts and your, your really becomes what the Bible describes and uses the word lust. Often that's attributed to sexual things, but the desire and the craving is no less for many other things. Any kind of uh, addiction and, and kind of drawing and, and just I have to, I have to, I have to, must have, must do, must see, must no, that's going to be a problem. And so people desire riches. Can I tell you, there are millionaires, even billionaires, who are still trying to get more. They couldn't spend what they have. But the desire is there because it's no, there's no satisfaction in their riches. Because they, they don't actually enjoy and do what they're called to do with that. They, they just continue to have the desire because the, the craving never leaves. You can be a very rich, you can be, you can be a very poor person with a lot of money. You can. You can have a whole lot of money in the bank and be poor on the inside. Well, you can also, right now, you may think, well, I don't have a whole lot of money in the bank. Well, then you can begin today's journey as a rich person on the inside. You just may not have a whole lot of cash in the bank, but you can be rich on the inside and you can let what God wants to add to you, add to you. And you can, you can walk through the, the, the laws of prosperity and the process uh, of that and, and walk by faith, which works by love, which is always going to keep you in the right balance because you're going to love God and love people, not yourself. Most of the desire that sends you in the wrong direction and sends these things which are meant for your good into a tailspin is the love of self or the desire for things for you. And again, there's nothing wrong with enjoying the things that God gives you. He gives us all, good, all things richly to enjoy. But He gives us those things. 
So again, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and, listen to it, harmful lusts. So the Bible actually goes on to, to, to take that word desire into when you fall into it, when desire leads you into it and you fall into it, it becomes a harmful lust. Riches do. If you are trying to desire them, you will end up in a place of lust with them and that will do you damage. It will be harmful to you. Which drown men in destruction and perdition. That doesn't sound like a place I want to be. Anybody fancy being drowned in, in destruction and perdition? I just, just don't think that sounds like a place any of us want to be. For, for the love of money, the love of money is the, a root of all kinds of evil. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So a Christian starting out in a good place getting a wrong understanding of what this means can end up in a bad place. They can. And there's been abuses of this. But just because there's been abuses of this does not turn around and take away from the fact that God wants you blessed, that God wants you rich, that God wants you out of debt, that God wants you in a place of overflow. God wants to put you there. But you can't try to get you there apart from His way. There's only one way into that which is in a place of balance and truth. Any other way, any other attempt, any other uh, 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 channel through which you try to get there is going to be false. It's going to be destructive. So if God instructs you to start a business, if God instructs you to invest, if God instructs you to... You, you, you better know that there's going to be a whole lot of things, principles of faith and love and, and, and the laws of prosperity that God's going to interject in that and how He's going to get you to do that. God never tells you just to take the city. He tells you how to take the city. God didn't tell Je Joshua just to go take Jericho. Uh, have at it. Uh, however you want. Just charge or something, you know, whatever. Well, even, uh, even if he'd said charge, that would have been an instruction, right? But he didn't. He specifically told Joshua, now I want you to do this and this and this and this. So if God's got a business for you, if God's got, even in your workplace, maybe God calls you to go into a workplace and he wants the blessing of the Lord to ride on into that business with you. We went and prayed with some, some folks uh, on, uh, the other day and I thought it was quite interesting because um, when we walked in there, it was just empty. There was just nobody in there. In the time we were in there praying, three, three lots of, of, of couples walked in there, into that business. Now, that man's a Christian. He's blessed. But we specifically started praying the blessing over that business. We had to stop praying because there was people in there. And we, so we just, I just carried on walking around just blessing the, the business. See, see we've got, if, God leads you, if God leads you in to work at McDonald's, that's going to be the most blessed McDonald's on the planet. be hard to bless Big Macs, but anyway, <laughs> not really food, but anyway, but, but you, you know what I'm saying, if, 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 but wherever God would have you, there's a blessing that comes on, on you and through you and with you. And so it's the harmful lusts which drown men into destruction and the love of money which chasing after it gets us into that difficult, dangerous, evil place. But you, O oh man of God. Okay, now, now he's addressing, he's addressing us. Say, say he's addressing me. He's addressing me. Say, I'm a, a, you can say male or man or woman. It's okay in this church. We can identify men and women. Is that all right? So I'm a man or I'm a woman of God. I'm a woman of God. All right, praise God. So he's addressing you. Flee these things and pursue righteousness. That is such a key. You can't, just flee lust. Where are you going to run to? You'll run into a pile, another pile of lust. You understand addictive behaviors, that which, that which controls a person's desires. Addic you can leave alcohol 
and find yourself in cigarettes. You can leave cigarettes and find yourself in pornography. You can leave pornography and find yourself in gambling. Do you understand? The, it's the addictive, demonic nature behind that which tries to influence. You can leave one addiction and find yourself in another because the addictive behavior is still desiring. Yeah. You can be addicted to work. Did you know that? Yeah. You can become a workaholic. Yeah. You can be addicted to, you can actually be addicted to working out. You can be addicted to the exhilaration of strife. People are addicted to strife. I've watched it. People, I've, found, I've seen people who are not happy unless there's some kind of drama going on because of the exhilaration and the, and the adrenaline that they get from that. People in, in the army, and it's part of the uh, uh, post-traumatic uh, uh, stress uh, dis, stress. Syndrome. Uh, part of all of that is is when they come out of a place where there's there's this adrenaline and this adrenaline and this this action and this stuff and their heightened awareness and heightened alert and and, and things that they've seen. Do you, do you, know, you know when you cut yourself and you don't even realize it at first? Have you ever seen that? Have you ever cut yourself with a really sharp knife and you didn't even know it, that you'd done it? Or, or if you're working out, or, or if you're hammering away, or doing something, you can actually hurt yourself. And, and, and in the midst of something, sports is a classic with this, because there's such adrenaline going through, you can actually do some serious damage to yourself, and you don't really even feel it as much until, until you stop later, and the adrenaline stops, and all of a sudden you're in pain. And so sometimes when people are on the battlefield and stuff, they experience things, they see things, and it's not till they come home and stop that it just hits them. Hits them hard, you know. I was trying to remember where I was going with that now. There was a purpose in that. Addiction, Addiction that's right. And so thank you. And so, and, and so what can happen is, is, that, is that like that addiction um, that, or addictive addiction to even adrenaline, that there, are, there are people who are in, in those kinds of industries or the p police force or, or whatever, and, and it, can be, it can be such that, that you don't know how to function outside of that f what's feeding you. And so all of that sets you up for an addictive behavior style, or an addictive behavior that tries to, the, 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 the demonic or Satan tries to manipulate inside a person. Well, Jesus has set you free from all of that. Jesus has set you free from all of that. That's one of the things he said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me. What? To set captives free. You, you don't have to be held captive to any kind of addictive behavior or any kind of demonic thing that would seek to control you or force you into a place of, of desire or lust or any of those kinds of things at all. That, that's not what you need to be held captive by. There is a liberty for you. And I'm going to go into, in just a little while, I'm going to show you how you do that. It's not that difficult. The word gives us clear definition. Now, the application of it, the only difficulty of this is will you do it? That's the difficulty. Knowing what to do is one thing. Most Christians, it, most Christians, when you, when you see this, you'll kind of say, well, yeah, I kind of know that. The, the problem where lust exists within the church in any of those facets and more that I've just, than I've described it's not whether or not we know the truth about what to do. It's the whether or not we will do it. And whether or not we will do it comes down to this. Whether or not you want to do it. Or whether or not you actually really enjoy still being connected to that thing, even though you feel shame and guilt later on. How many times have... How many times... Oh, this is re revealing a little bit of my past now. But how many times when I was a young teenager, when I was going out and getting drunk... How many times the next morning had, did I say, I'm never going to do that again? With well, my head's pounding and, you know, all of this going on. And I didn't even, I didn't even, honestly, when I was, I didn't even enjoy it. I didn't even enjoy the night before. It was out of a lot of peer pressure. But I know, I've heard that people say that so many times and joke about it. Why do people go back to it? Just keeps on coming back. Keeps some things keep on rolling around back into people's lives. Because why? They want, they want some, They don't really want to let go of that. They don't really mean that. I'm never going to do that again. They don't really mean that. No. 
And, and, and there's the, the guilt and the shame and everything that often, often comes out of the harmful lusts that manifest. But you, are man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. You, have to, you can't just flee one thing, you have to pursue something. You have to fix your eyes on something. God hasn't just redeemed you from sin and sickness and disease and poverty. God has redeemed you to righteousness, to God, to Jesus. And so when we turn our back on sin, the only way, in fact, the only way to turn your back on sin, do you know what? If you do not turn your fa eyes to face Jesus, you can turn your back on one sin and just be staring right at another one or it'll move right in front of you again. The only way is to fix your eyes on something else. You have to fix your eyes on Jesus. And you have to put something between you and the thing that is trying to control you. Now, this self-control or temperance, self-control really in some ways isn't the best descriptive of it, the English descriptive, because it sounds like you're controlling things with yourself. And that's not necessarily what temperance really means. It's not a soul-based, self-based temperance. It is a spirit-based temperance that uses the power of God and the grace of God to overcome and enable you. It really has little, if nothing, to do with self. And so, we find out that we will prosper. The point of increase in our lives comes when our soul is in prosperity, both in the health realm and the finance realm. We, we learned that in 3 John 1 and Verse 2, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So the soul is not what generates the power, but the soul certainly is helped by the power in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So the soul is a wonderful gift and it's designed to respond to the divine life of God. Your soul, mind, will, and emotions, will, will is a big factor in this, by the way, because you've got to want, you, the want to still got to be there. And there's times when you're going to have to be on your knees and say, God, I want you to help me, be, help me want to. <laughs> you're going to have to get honest with this sometimes. There are people who are locked up in addictions and locked up in lusts and locked up in these sorts of things and they hate it but they don't know how to get rid of it. And sometimes the most honest thing they can do is say, God, I need you to help me want to get rid of this because people are addicted. You've got to, help, you've got to, you've got to want to be free from strife, which keeps feeding a habitual thought pattern. And sometimes you're just going to have to ask God to help you help your want. God, help. It's like the guy who said, I believe, help my unbelief. <laughs> And you know what? The grace of there is the grace of God is there for that. That's what that grace is for. It's just the supply and the favor and the uh, the power to enable you to head in the right direction. So it's a wonderful gift. Well, the rich young ruler was controlled by his things. The sadness that came upon him. When Jesus said, hey, why don't you go, here's how to do, here's how to do this. Here's how to separate, here's how to change financial systems. Here's how to walk in real prosperity. Go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. This guy got, this guy in his soul, he became very, very sad. There was a, there was a grief. He actually began grieving. He was grieving the stuff before he even got rid of it. That grief took hold of him. The very thought of not having that nice new camel, the very thought of giving that away to someone caused grief and sorrow and loss to start gripping him so that he actually walked away from an offer of being on Jesus' own personal ministry staff. After running up to Jesus, after being a, kind of coming with all enthusiasm, you know? I mean, maybe he'd been a significant contributor to Jesus of Nazareth Ministries. We, we don't know, but, but this turned him away. And Jesus wasn't, wasn't trying to get him bound by poverty. He was trying to free this guy up. What was his problem? He was, the stuff owned him. And the, the thought of not having it owned him. 
Well, the question, question later on asked uh, by Jesus, how, you know, how, how hard it is. He said, for, the, for it is easier for, the camel, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. We could go into the technical details of that. The eye of the needle was actually a gate, a small gateway in, into Jerusalem, which you actually had to unload the camel, get the camel through, bring the stuff through, and then put it back on again. It wasn't necessarily talking about about the thread. That kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the context of what he's saying. But anyway, uh, but it is difficult for a camel, camel through the eye. Yes. But it, this, in other words, what, what he was saying, and the people understood this of this day, is that the eye of the needle was a particular gate, and to get the camel through was difficult unless you unloaded it. If you took it all off, the camel could go through. So what's he, what was he saying to this rich young man? You can't, you can't enter in. You can't get in. It's like trying to go through that small door. You can't get in there unless you offload all the stuff, the weight that you're carrying, then you'll be able to go through. Hallelujah. That's what, that's what Jesus was saying. Peter said, see, we've left all to follow you. So he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who, shall, who and he can't help himself, who shall not receive many times more in this present time. Can you see, so can you see, if, if you are to leave behind the thing that you're lusting after, if you are to leave behind the thing that's trying to control your thinking and your soul and your desire and your emotions, if you would leave behind that thing, there is a reward. There is whatever you thought you were getting out of that, God has got manifold fulfillment in Him. Are you hearing me? There's nothing that you desire, that you're craving after, that God hasn't already planned a much better version of. Jesus is trying to get this place, this, this young man to a much better place. Jesus wasn't trying to get wealth from him, but to him. Huh. I wrote this down. Sounds a little strange, it probably worked better two weeks ago when I explained this word a little bit. But, but what, lev what area of incontinence have you got? <laughs> and if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I explained that the word continence is the word for, uh, for self-control. It's, it's one of the meanings of that, where the bladder is controlled, but it's continence. Incontinence is when the, you have no control over the bladder. Well, continence is not only, a, the word continence is not only applied to bladder control. You understand that. So, so incontinence is not only applied to the lack of bladder control. But what level of, what area of incontinence in your life that should be controlled un, by the Spirit is functional in your life. It's a question. I'm, I'm not asking you to, to, to come under condemnation, but you want to you wanna identify it if you want to deal with it. Do you have no control over that food? Do you have no control over looking at that stuff on the internet? Do you have no control over what you have to have that next pair of shoes? There's a few ouches I heard just then. Do you have to have that donut? It's really unfortunate after I preached that the other week, my sister-in-law Linda posted the biggest donut in the world on her <laughs> Facebook page. I tried to warn her beforehand, but she hadn't heard the sermon, so praise God. Well, if you have to have any of these things, then you're not submitted to the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit living within you. Hey, you're still a Christian. You're still going to heaven. You're still loved, but you've not yielded. It's not, there's, it's, there's not a, a lordship dynamic in that area of your life. The fear of the Lord doesn't exist, which is, gives you the, supplies the wisdom and the power. Those things still have a pull on you. The thing you have to buy, can I tell you this? You won't enjoy it. You, you won't enjoy it. And more often than not, if you've, if you've gotten something that way, you'll lose it. It'll break. It'll be stolen. Somehow it'll, the enemy will momentarily drive you in that direction and then whip it away from you because that's what he's like. 
Sexual intimacy will never satisfy because the lust of the flesh has nothing to do with true loving intimacy. That kind of operation, that kind of lust, pornography and all those sorts of things will, will never satisfy, just brings further guilt and shame and interrupts actually the proper functionality of that within the correct marriage relationship. You never truly enjoy your food when natural appetite for what your body actually needs is replaced with overwhelming cravings from addictions to food substances or false food substances or processed things that aren't supposed to be in your body in the first place. But there is a natural satisfaction that your body can enjoy when it's given the things it wants or needs, rather, properly. There's a difference between the body knowing what it needs, which by the way, often happens with pregnant women, that, you know, needing iron or something. My wife wanted to eat silver beet and so forth. Well, that's a natural. The body knows what it needs. And actually, your body's quite clever in that. But, but it's, that's different to the body being addicted to a substance that it wants. And the biggest one in society today, of course, is sugar, white sugar. It's just the biggest addiction on this planet. And it's one can of Coca-Cola is nine teaspoons of sugar. Nine teaspoons. Yeah, we may as well call it poison. Though. It's, it, literally, it literally is in, in the body and it messes completely, can kill your immune system for at least 24 hours. A can of Coke can. So, so it's, not only is that harmful, but here's the, here's, the, here's the difficulty of it, and it's a good picture of it. Not only is it harmful to the body, but your body tells itself that it wants it that it needs it, that it must have it. And in fact, you can rep you've replaced some of the things that the body should naturally do in that process with, a, with the counterfeit, which is the addictive substance. And this is, this is no different to any other kind of thing. Put food aside, to put that into any of the things we've talked about. You will find that the counterfeit, the, you, inside your, your, you will train yourself to, to desire and crave and have an addiction to the counterfeit thing it's always a counterfeit. There's always, God always has a, a, pro, a, a true version which will fulfill. People are out there trying to get high. Trying to, trying to have a place, really what is that when they go, people go to, go to drugs to get, a, to get a high? It's a place of elation that leaves behind this natural world and the pressure of that. Can I tell you? You can do that with God. <laughs> you can do that in a revelation of your heavenly existence and, your, and your, your place in the heavenlies and the joy, the true joy and the elation and the exaltation that comes with that. In fact, that's what the fruit of the Spirit is about, to lift you up out of this natural counterfeit where you have to keep going on these emotional roller coaster rides to actually stay in a place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, how do you walk in temperance self control? Let me give you some clues here. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. How do we do this? What, what tools, what empowerment? What supply has God given us to be able to do this? 2 Peter 1, verse 1. This letter is from Simon Peter, slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. Isn't that amazing? You have the same faith the apostle Peter has. Isn't that, isn't that cool? You've got the same faith that Peter has. We say, well, Peter was a man of faith. Well, he said the, same, the faith he had, you've got. It's the same stuff, so you, there's no excuses. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Saviour. In other words, he didn't he give this kind of faith to the Apostle Peter and this kind of faith to Kenneth Copeland and this kind of faith to Billy Graham and then, well, no, I'm going to give you this kind of faith because, you know, you're not quite there. No, it's the same faith. It's the measure of faith dealt to every man. So th this faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ our God and Saviour. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. 
May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace coming through the knowledge. Well, you're going to have to listen to some word then. You're going to have to not only listen, but you're going to have to receive that word and then you're going to have to do something with that word because the more revelation knowledge that gets on the inside of you, the more grace and peace is made available to you. Now you still have to do something with grace and peace. But the more you, work, you grow in knowledge. So verse 3 says, By His divine power. Well, how much power does the divine have? I mean, it's all power. It's God. This is God we're talking about. Not, this is by His divine power has been given us everything we need for living a godly life. I want you to say that with me. God, by His divine power, has given us everything we need to live a godly life. Then he goes on and says, We have received all this by coming to know Him. So, so knowledge is not knowledge apart from Him. Knowledge is not head knowledge. Knowledge is not just understanding a concept or a principle. But knowledge is an intimacy with Him. It is the face of Jesus. When you hear the words of Jesus, you don't just hear a concept or a law or an instruction, when you hear the words of Jesus, you see the face of Jesus. You, hear, you feel the breath of Jesus. Can, can you understand? This is, this is knowing Him. Not knowing about Him. And not just knowing about His Word. The, the Bible is... The, the world is full of Christians. Now let me, put, let me rein that in just a little bit. That's a too big a statement. There are too many... Christians in this world who know what the Word says but don't know who the Word is. Now they may be saved, but they don't, when they read the Word, they don't, they don't hear the heartbeat, they don't see the intimacy, they don't understand the touch of God. They see an instruction or a law or, 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 or something along those lines. And in fact, you can, in that place, you can read the Word and you can even get an instruction in terms of sexual purity, what we were just talking about a minute ago, and completely discount it because you don't have a revelation of the heart behind what was said. You can take that instruction to not do this and not do that and think, well, you know, that's just, you know, old stuff. We're in modern days now. And what comes out of your mouth can sound really good. You can, have a, a, you can even have a great message. I'm going to get myself in trouble right now. And some of you are going to be a little bit disappointed with this. You can preach a great message about love at a royal wedding and preside over an institution where you personally endorsed homosexual priests. Sorry to spoil that for you, some of you. The message can be great. The words can be powerful. And you, don't, you can't take anything away from the words because the words are still truth, because it's the Scripture. I'm telling you, it's not just, it's not just enough to know what the Word says. You've got to know the one in whom and through whom the breath came. So he goes on and says, We have received all this by coming to know him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. We've got to know him. Because otherwise the, word, the, script, the scriptures are going to be twisted. And skillfully done. But they're going to come, they're going to come, and they're going to come in a way that, that is deceptive. Folks, decept the problem with deception is it's deceiving. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature. Did you just hear that? 
Not only does this promise come to you, not only does this promise and uh, 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 these, these, this word, this knowledge and this intimacy with him, knowing him, uh, come to you, but, but God says that it actually enables you to share his nature. That is real intimacy. That's not just preaching about love, that's actually knowing love. True love. Bible love. The God kind of love. And that has nothing to do with Hollywood. That has nothing to do with man's version. He's given us these precious promises, great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature. And it, now listen, listen to what happens with the sharing of the divine nature. Listen to what happens with the knowledge as it becomes intimate. And escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Did you see that? That's the separation. The participation with the divine nature. Through the knowledge and the great and precious promises of God through His Word. Being, being breath to you, life to you. When that place of intimacy in that promise, in that Word, it becomes Him to you. When you don't hear just someone preaching or read just something on a page, but you hear the heart of Jesus, when that's actually revelation, then it literally separates you from the world's corruption caused by human desires. The divine nature cannot be connected to that. Verse 5, in view of all this, make every effort. Does that sound like there might be a little bit of responsibility that we have in this process? Make every effort to respond. No, you can't make every effort to try to do because it's the grace that helps you do. But you have to make every effort to respond to the grace that's available to you. Respond to God's promises. Respond to His promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. And moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. There it is. And with self-control, with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everybody. Real love, Bible love. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What will you be? Productive and useful. Without growing in this, not productive, not useful. Verse 9, but those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed. Now here's the good news. Have been cleansed. Your response to the Word and your participation with the divine nature is not to try to get cleansed. It's to participate with the truth that you have been cleansed. So when we go back to the scripture we were looking at earlier, if we would cleanse ourselves of the latter, how do we cleanse ourselves of the latter? We have to participate with the cleansing that's already been done. The work that Jesus has already accomplished. We have to work with that. We have to participate with that. We have to believe we receive what was done on the cross 2,000 years ago. Now, if there is an act of sin that is done, then you confess that sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So, but, but again, even that, how did that happen? The precious promises of God and the cleansing blood of Jesus and the, and the broken body of Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, let's understand that. Let's, how do we do that? Put the body and blood of Jesus between you and what you desire. If you're really serious about being separated from the things that have tried to control you, then you take the communion elements. And if it's a TV screen, if it's a computer screen, if it's a book, if it's a magazine, if it's, a, if it's food, if it's, if it's a bowl of sugar, if it's whatever it is, 
Put that on one side of the table and get the body and the blood of Jesus and put, you, put that between you and that. If you're really serious, I'm talking really serious, because we're not talking about doing something lightly here. We're talking about the body and the blood of Jesus. Well, let's have some scripture on that. John 17, 14 through 19, he says, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. Well, we're still here, aren't we? But that you should keep them from the evil one, or the evil. Keep them from evil, literally it says. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now listen. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Well, Jesus is the word made flesh and he is the bread of life. Amen. So when we take that communion wafer, that cracker, that bread, we break that. It represents the body of Jesus broken for us. Now his bones weren't broken, his, but his, his back was broken open. His, you know, all of that was broken open. His limbs, his arms were out of joint. I mean, he was a mess. And so when we do that, we remember that. That the Word who was made flesh was broken for us. Why? To sanctify us. That he would take all of that to separate all of that from us. He's already done it. So he said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So the word of God, who is Jesus, the great and precious promises of God, we can take that and that, that itself, the word itself cleanses us, cleans us, sanctifies us and separates it from. Again, comes back to not just knowing the word, but knowing who is the word. You need to know in whom you have believed, not just what you have believed. He says, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. So Jesus is saying the word will separate you. So when you take communion, you take communion by the word. And you understand that it is the Word who was made flesh that was broken that would to separate you. And so you take these great and precious promises. You take the promise of God's love. You take the promise of God's grace. You take the promise of His power and His Holy Spirit within you. And you separate yourself from this thing by the Word. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 says, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Sanctified by the body of Jesus once and for all. Once and for all. So he doesn't do it again and again and again and again every time you come to him and confess or repent or whatever. The sanctification was done once and for all, but you, you get back on, back in on that participation of the sanctification. He separated you. Remember, you can't just separate from something. You have to separate to something. You can't just separate from lust. You have to separate yourself to Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Him. Well, that's the body. How does the blood sanctify us? All oh, the blood of Jesus, as the song goes. When we use the sanctifying blood of Jesus as the legal case to plead the blood as a sanctification, it separates us. Now, this verse is probably familiar to you in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. It's an overcoming verse. It's an overcoming verse. It says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Another way of saying that, by the way, is, and by the testimony of the word. Because what's in our mouth, our word, should be the word. So our testimony of the word is the, is the word of our testimony. Amen. And, and they did not love their lives to death. Now I'm going to come back to that. I want you to hear those words because that's, that's how, we, how we overcome. But let's back up into the, the, the blood helps us overcome. But let's back up into what that means. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. 
This is a new altar. This is a heavenly altar. This is a divine thing, spiritual thing. For the bodies of those animals, the Old Testament sacrifices, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned outside the camp. Now listen to this. Listen to the spiritual dynamic of this. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify. Jesus also what? Outside the gates. Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his what? Own blood suffered outside the gate. So Jesus' blood was a sancti is a sanctification. So when we take, now think about this. Think about this now. When we take the body and we take the blood and we put that genuinely between us and the thing that's trying to control our soul and the habitual thought patterns and the habits and the lusts and all of that, we have got two sanctifying powers through the cross of Jesus, the body and the blood of Jesus. Man, I'm telling you, if you're willing to do this, as a serious thing, if you're willing to put this between you and whatever it is in your life, anything, you may say, well, I don't have anything. Praise God. Praise God. Then, then pray for those that do. They need to be set free. Hallelujah. People say, I don't, I don't, have, I don't have time to sin. sin, to sin. I, I'm, I'm working all the time. Well, you're probably addicted to work then. <laughs> I don't have time to sin. Watching too much television. I don't know, whatever it is. But here's the point. is the blood and the body of Jesus come together. And what happens? They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And here it is. The selflessness of this manifestation. And they loved not their own lives, even unto death. You, you, did you hear that? You don't love your own life. You, that, that, there is no craving left in that statement. There is no self-drive left in that statement. There is no self-ishness left in that statement. It, it, is, it is all about him. It's all about His Word, His blood, what He's done. Let the Word in your heart and in your mouth be the faith life that sanctifies you, separates you, and the blood enable you in your overcoming victory walk. If you try to do this with willpower, you, you will eventually fail. You might do it for a little while, but then you'll feel doubly guilty. That's just soul. However, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, temperance. It's, it's spiritual force. They overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they love not their own lives, even unto the death. And certainly the death of Jesus. And then the resurrection of Jesus. Your old, die, your old self died with him on the cross. Your new you raised with him. And you're now seated with him in heavenly places. You're not supposed to have any of that nonsense in your life. Now the world's vying for it. The world's chasing you for it. The world's screaming at you with it. But what's ahead of us? The glory of the latter house to be greater than the former. The glory that God wants to pour through you and through me and through this family and other church families and globally. The, re the revival power that he wants to pour forth. My goodness. My goodness. But let's, let's enter into the sanctification that he's already done for us. Let's enter into the cleansing. You've already been cleansed by the word, Jesus said. It's already there. Let's, let's believe it and let's receive it. And I challenge you this week, if there's something that you need separated from you, if there's something that needs, if there's some kind of desire, there's some kind of pull on you that needs, you need to be separated, I, I challenge you, take communion. 
But I mean, take time before to, to sit down and go, the, go over those scriptures again. And you put the blood of Jesus between you and that stuff. It'll be powerful. It'll be powerful. The next, the next thing you could do, if you really want to, if you're really, really, really serious, is then talk to one of the pastors. Make yourself accountable. That kind of stings a little bit. Because we're not going to be dealing with condemnation or, or judgment or any other thing. We're actually going to be dealing with the victory that you're walking in now and rejoice with you, and, but help you walk in a place of accountability and have the right to ask you about something along those lines later on if necessary. But that's if you're really serious about staying on that side of things. Amen. That was quiet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes these messages are strong, hey, but also necessary if we're going to do what we're called to do. 